other than our spacecraft's namesake, heliophysicist Eugene Parker. The solar wind spews harmful solar particles way beyond Pluto, and no one knows exactly what accelerates it so far, so fast. That's why Parker is designed to hang out near the origin of this wind, so we can finally figure out what it's doing and what it could potentially do to Earth. Thanks, Jessica. Data collected by Parker Solar Probe will provide an unprecedented picture of the sun. NASA Edge's Franklin Fitzgerald is live on set right now with senior heliophysicist Eric Christian. Hi, Franklin. Hi, Marie. Now, Eric, you're the deputy principal investigator for the ESA suite of instruments on Parker Solar Probe. Tell us what those instruments are going to be used for. So the easiest instruments study solar energetic particles, the highest energy particles coming from the sun. These are pieces of atoms that are moving at up to half the speed of light. And they're important. They're one of the three science questions for Parker Solar Probe. These are the particles that can actually damage spacecraft and even be in danger to astronauts. Now, you said there's one of the questions that Parker Solar Probe is going to be looking at. What are the other two? So the other two questions are, why is the corona hotter than the surface of the sun? That seems really weird. Normally when you get further from a fire, you get colder. The corona is millions of degrees, whereas the surface of the sun is only thousands of degrees. How that happens, we're going to go to where the action is and figure that out. The third question is, how is the solar wind, this stream of particles that the sun blows out in all directions all the time, how is that accelerated up to a million miles an hour? Again, from Earth, we can't figure that out. It's all been smeared out 93 million miles away. By going close to the sun, we can be where it's happening and actually measure why the solar wind is being accelerated. And actually, Parker Solar Probe is actually going to be looking at the origin of space weather, where the solar winds and uh, the space weather begins. That's right. So we're trying to do some basic science that'll be able to get us to the point where we can do models that predict space weather, which is what our eventual goal is. In, on the Earth, terrestrial weather, they're doing much better now on predictions, and that's because they have these really complicated atmospheric models, but they needed to do some basic science on how winds affected winds at other altitudes, how hurricanes move, you know, and all that basic science was needed before they could do the models. We're doing the basic science for space weather models. Eric, thank you for your help this evening, and uh, I'm sure you're going to go find a spot to see the launch this evening. I'm really excited about it. All right. Marie, back to you. All right. Thanks, Franklin. Let's check in now with Josh and Mick in the Mission Director Center for an update and a closer look at the Delta IV Heavy, one of the world's most powerful rockets. Guys? Thank you, Marie, and welcome back to the Mission Director Center. It takes a team to be able to launch the Delta IV Heavy this evening. Teams from NASA, United Launch Alliance, the U.S. Air Force, and more. Mick, can you characterize the teamwork that goes into to doing something like this tonight? Yes, Josh, as you said, it's a, it's a team effort to get a mission this far prepared for launch. Uh, mission teams working around the country have uh, prepared the rocket and the spacecraft uh, for this morning's launch attempt. Uh, Teams from United Launch Alliance uh, stationed in uh, Denver, Colorado, from their production and manufacturing facility in Decatur, Alabama. We have spacecraft from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Laurel, Maryland, and of course right here in Florida, the team uh, worked on the spacecraft at Astrotech in Titusville and here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station inside the Mission Director Center uh, at Hangar AE and the Delta Operations Center. And that's a live shot inside the Delta Operations Center that we just saw there with the NASA Launch Manager Omar Baez and the Launch Director Lou Mangieri from Nana Launch Alliance are working with teams uh, toward a liftoff today of the Delta IV Heavy. Earlier in the countdown, the team received a weather briefing from the Air Force, which improved the weather forecast uh, to 95% go, only a 5% probability of violation. But the U.S. Air Force not only briefs the launch teams of weather, which could impact a launch, but they also keep the launch teams aware of other launch considerations on the Eastern Range, including telemetry coverage for public safety. And they update the teams on COLAs. Mick, can you talk about COLAs? 
Yeah, your reference to COLAs or Collision Avoidance Analysis, which is performed by the United States Air Force for public safety and, and the rocket safety, actually. Uh, one of the considerations they analyze is objects in space. For example, other satellites around the Earth that could be in the flight path of the Delta IV Heavy this morning. Uh, with a 65-minute window today, uh, there could be some small cutouts, what we refer to, where the launch teams would not be able to lift off. Uh, this analysis is started uh, days out. Uh, the final report is provided to the launch manager, uh, Omar Baez, uh, on the day of launch to help determine today's T0 for the launch attempt. Uh, we've heard there's no COLA cutouts uh, for today's launch attempt, so we're still on schedule for a 3.31 a.m. launch. And we do have an hour and five minute window should launch teams need more time. But we're at the beginning of the window right now. You're looking at live shots of the Delta IV Heavy rocket. And Mick, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, about what's happened up to this point? Yeah, right now we're in the T-4 and holding. Uh, we've got about 12 and a half minutes left in this uh, built-in hold. Uh, teams have been working to get uh, cryogenic tanking completed. Uh, those operations are uh, finishing up uh, with topping and maintaining uh, continuing. Uh, things are progressing towards that 3.31 a.m. liftoff, as I mentioned before. We do have that 65-minute or hour and five-minute window that you had talked about for tonight's launch attempt in case something does come up. But uh, right now, all things are go and looking good for an on-time liftoff at 3.31 a.m. So a lot going on here in the Mission Director Center, and we'll keep listening in to the launch teams as they prepare for a liftoff. But for now, we'll go back to Murray. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. NASA's Tori McClendon is standing by live at one of our launch viewing areas with one of NASA's senior leaders, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin. Tori? Thanks, Marie. Dr. Zerbukin, as head of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, help us understand why this mission was selected and why we need to study our sun. Wow, this mission has been a long time coming. You know, that for 60 years we tried to do this mission, and it was selected finally because we had a mission that actually is feasible and viable. So we had the technologies to protect a spacecraft from the heat and we had a mission that was fitting into our budget. So we're ready to go with this Parker Solar Probe. So talking about going back 60 years, this is the first time ever that NASA has named a spacecraft after a living person, Dr. Eugene Parker. Can you talk about that decision? Oh yes. I was so excited to be able to call him and tell him, hey, can we name a spacecraft after you? And he's like, uh, yes, that, that would be fine. You know, it's the only name that really fits there. Uh, first of all, he is the guy who came up with uh, solar wind yeah. as a theoretical, theoretical concept before it was found and observed in, in space. It's also true that his theories are really at the heart of 35 of our missions, of our 107 missions in science. And so it's just an incredible impact he's had. So his name belongs there. Well, uh, what about, talk about NASA's Living with a Star program and how this mission fits into that. Living with a Star is an important part of heliophysics overall. So the mission, of course, does fundamental science. It, it looks at the atmosphere of our star and with it, the atmosphere of stars everywhere. This is our Rosetta Stone. Our sun is our Rosetta Sun. Well, it's also our star in a sense that it's the source of space weather. And living with a star, of course, is focused very much on understanding space weather, really what the impact is of these emissions on our technological societies, the systems in space and on the ground that are affected by these perturbations that come, are coming down. Well, we're definitely looking forward to the launch this morning. And you'll be watching with Dr. Parker himself, I hear? Uh, absolutely. I look forward to being right there with him. And, and I, I want to look at him when it, you know, this rocket yes. goes up there. Great. Well, with that, I think we'll go back to you, Marie. All right. Thank you. Parker Solar Probe will set off to soak up the sun in about 14 minutes, but it's already had quite the journey. Here's a look at the months of work that led to this moment.
For those of you just joining us, you're looking at a live view of Parker Solar Probe poised on the launch pad, ready to lift off in just about 12 minutes on a journey to kiss the sun and unlock its mysteries. I'm NASA's Marie Lewis. Parker Solar Probe is targeted to launch at 3.31 this morning, Eastern Time, from Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. The launch window will be open for 65 minutes. Parker will take off on a United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket, speeding up to 430,000 miles per hour in orbit. That's fast enough to get from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in just one second. It will travel seven times closer to the sun than any spacecraft before. Parker will help us understand how the sun affects weather in space. And that space weather is important. First, a little background why. Parker Solar Probe is named after Dr. Eugene Parker, a physicist who figured out 60 years ago that our star actually has its own wind and storms, and they can spread far into space. This space weather can disrupt communication signals from our satellites and even cause power outages on Earth. Besides impacts here on the ground, we also need to understand solar wind to help us explore deeper into space. Just as ocean explorers need to understand currents, NASA needs to understand space weather to help us send astronauts to the moon, Mars, and other distant destinations. Scientists have sought answers about space weather for more than 60 years and will send Parker into temperatures of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit to find them. We are now about 10 minutes from liftoff, so let's go over to the Mission Director Center for an update from United Launch Alliance, and then Josh will take us through the count. Josh? Thank you, Marie, and I'm being joined by Alyssa McBeth of United Launch Alliance. Good morning, Alyssa. Good morning. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. Uh, we first have a video of the Delta IV and animation t of it taking off and what's going to happen at T minus zero. If we could roll the video. Two, one, and lift off. Lift off of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV heavy rocket. Three Delta IV RS-68A main engines ignite and generate more than 2.1 million pounds of thrust to lift the rocket away from the pad. The Delta IV reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound, at 1 minute 18 seconds. At 3 minutes 56 seconds, the port and starboard booster engine shut down. Two seconds later, the boosters are jettisoned. At 5 minutes 36 seconds, propellant levels deplete and the main engine shuts down. Seven seconds later, the Delta IV separation system activates to release the first stage. At five minutes, 55 seconds, the first Delta cryogenic second stage, or DCSS main engine burn, begins. At approximately six minutes, five seconds, the payload fairing is jettisoned. At 10 minutes, 37 seconds, cutoff of the DCSS engine, or MECO-1, occurs. At 22 minutes, 25 seconds, the DCSS main engine is restarted for the second burn. Approximately 14 minutes later, second cutoff of the DCSS main engine occurs. Following a 30-second coast phase, the third stage is separated. 20 seconds later, the third stage is ignited. Approximately 1 minute, 29 seconds later, burnout of the third stage solid rocket motor occurs. At 43 minutes, 10 seconds, the third stage releases NASA's Parker Solar Probe spacecraft on its journey to the sun. Alyssa, a lot happens after T0, but can you tell me what's happened up to this point and what's about to happen in the count? Yeah, so we're the rocket is ready to go at this point. It's fueled. Um, the people on console are... All their systems have been checked out and are ready to go, and we're about to enter into a terminal count poll um, conducted by the launch conductor, where the launch conductor will poll each engineer and verify that their systems are, in fact, ready um, with a, a simple go, um, and that indicates that the launch is ready and Delta is ready to fly. And we're just about 18 seconds away from that pole live on your screen. You can see the Delta IV heavy rocket with the additional third stage at Space Launch Complex. 37 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and we'll listen in to this poll in about five seconds. Status check to proceed with terminal count. First stage systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Locks. Go. LH2. Go. Second stage systems, locks. Go. LH2. Go. Third stage systems, 
There's Savage, Vehicle Manager. Go. Electrical Systems, Airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight Control. Go. Com. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation Support. Go. Pneumatics. Go. Go. Umbilicals. Go. Hazgas. Go. ECS. Go. Red Line Monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op Safety Manager. Go. ULA Safety Officer. Go. Vehicle System Engineer. Go. Anomaly Chief. Go. Range Coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch Director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. MEQ, established swing arm lock pins pulled. Active. And we just hold, heard the poll with all stations reporting that they're go for launch. Alyssa, we're, we're entering the final few minutes of the count here, about five minutes and 45 seconds before we launch. And can you tell me what it means to United Launch Alliance to be able to launch the Parker Solar Probe mission? Yeah. Um, ULA is always excited about doing interplanetary missions. The chance to get to explore the solar system is something that we look forward to and are happy to be a part of. Um, this mission means a lot to us. It is um, a Delta Heavy, so uh, Delta Heavy gets to show off its performance and, and get Parker Solar Probe exactly where it needs to go, um, which is the only rocket um, currently that can, can do that. So we're excited to be a part of that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much for being with us and enjoy the launch today. Thank you. You as well. Thank you. L minus five minutes. OVM, transfer a third stage to internal power. Roger. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. And we have about 30 seconds remaining in our hold in the T minus clock. After that, the L minus and the T minus clocks will be synced up. You're looking at a live shot of the Delta IV heavy rocket poised for liftoff from Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And we'll pick up the count. Five, four, three, two. One. T minus four minutes and counting. Minus 355. Ground pyros enabled. And once again, we're about three minutes and 20 seconds before liftoff. And Mick, can you tell me what we have left to go in the, in the next three minutes? Yeah, the teams are securing uh, locks and L, uh, LH2, uh, liquid hydrogen uh, uh, tanking there. They'll be finishing that up, uh, getting ready to go internal. You'll hear a call for spacecraft uh, power to internal. They'll be arming their flight termination systems and getting ready for launch and then uh, bringing the Delta IV heavy launch vehicle onto internal power uh, to uh, prepare for the final terminal count. And it's 249. And we are coming up very shortly on the verification of the spacecraft being on internal. CBC locks the flight pressure and flight level. And it's 230. NSC, verify spacecraft on internal power. Verified. And we are at T minus two minutes, five seconds and counting. After liftoff, we'll be listening to the voice of United Launch Alliance, Patrick Moore providing ascent commentary. 155. Launch sequence or start.
Minus 140. FCS launch enable. 137. CBC LH2 at flight pressure and flight level. FTS armed. Minus 120. We'll see you arm. FCS count started. Two minus one minute. Engine start box go. Rock report range status. Ranger in. Fifty. LVO, LCOVM. Third stage is go for launch. Roger. Ranger. Second stage LH2 secure at fly level. Forty. Minus thirty. Status check. Go Delta. Go PSP. Minus 15. Profi ignition. 10, 9, nine start. 8, eight seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff of the mighty Delta IV heavy rocket with NASA's Parker Solar Probe. A daring mission to shed light on the mysteries of our closest star, the Sun. Booster engines continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. One minute, 45 seconds into flight. Trajectory continuing to look good right down the middle of the range track. ACS press valve has been opened. ACS pressure response looks good. Two minutes, ten seconds in. Strap-on boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. And Delta IV has gone to closed loop guidance. Two minutes, thirty seconds into flight. And at 2 minutes 39 seconds into flight, the Delta IV rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of almost 5,000 pounds per second. And launch vehicle is now 33 miles in altitude, 49 miles downrange distance, traveling at 4,500 miles per hour. Three minutes into flight. Our 68A engines in the port and starboard boosters continue to look good in the full thrust mode. Core booster looks good in the partial thrust mode. Three minutes, 15 seconds into flight.
trajectory continuing to look good down the middle of the range track. Approximately two minutes remaining in the boost phase of flight. Chamber pressure is continuing to look good on all three boosters. Port and starboard booster in the full thrust mode, core booster continuing in the partial thrust mode. And standing by for a strap-on booster throttle down momentarily. Port and starboard boosters have begun to throttle down. And we have jettison of both strap-on boosters. Core booster is throttled back up to full thrust. Response looks good. Four minutes, 25 seconds into flight. Upper stage lock system has begun boost phase chill down sequence. And one minute remaining in boost phase of flight. And upper stage fuel system has begun boost phase chill down. Five minutes into flight, just over 30 seconds now remaining in first stage, first stage phase of flight. Core booster engine continues to look good in the full thrust mode. Vehicle trajectory continuing down the middle of the range track. Five minutes, 20 seconds into flight. And standing by for core booster throttle down momentarily. Core booster has begun to throttle down. Standing by for Bico. And we have Bico booster engine cutoff standing by for stage step. And we have good indication of stage separation. Ned is deploying. We have pre-start on the RL-10. And we have ignition on the RL-10 engine. Engine chamber pressure looks good. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison. Now six minutes, 20 seconds into flight. And with the boost phase of flight complete, Parker Solar Probe will now continue its journey to the sun. And it's six minutes, 50 seconds into flight. Our L10 chamber pressure looks good. Seeing good responses on the upper stage RCS system. And uh, after a brief review of booster performance, seeing very close to nominal performance on the booster. And this first burn of the second stage will last approximately 4 minutes, 42 seconds. Now 7 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. About 3 minutes remaining in the first burn.
and at 8 minutes 30 seconds into flight, our all 10 chamber pressure continues to look good. Seeing very stable values on the upper stage LOX and LH2 tanks. ACS storage bottle pressure looks good. And vehicle body rates are very smooth. Now nine minutes into flight. At 9 minutes 40 seconds into flight, just under one minute remaining now in the first burn of the second stage. Second stage continuing to perform nominally. Carl 10 engine performing well. Uh, tank pressures look good. Vehicle body rates remain smooth. 10 minutes into flight. and about 30 seconds remaining in the first burn. And standing by for Miko one momentarily. And we have Miko. Body rate smoothing out nicely. And now seeing uh, upper stage ACS firings as expected. Now 11 minutes into flight. And this will be approximately a 13 minute coast duration prior to MES 2. From the Mission Director Center, I'm joined once again by Alyssa McBeth of United Launch Alliance. For those of you that are watching, we had an on-time liftoff today of the Delta IV Heavy Rocket. And Alyssa, can you tell me how the launch went? Oh, my goodness. That was a beautiful launch. Um, just the sound and everything. Oh, it was great. Um, it's looking good so far, too. Uh, we saw good separation of the, of the boosters from the main core and the booster from the second stage. Um, just experienced um, Miko 1. Uh, there t there's going to be two burns of the second stage, so that's coming up, the second burn, second engine start. Um, and then in just 40, approximately 45 minutes, uh, we'll see payload separation. So everything's looking good so far. Great. And can you tell me a little bit about, about, about your experience working with ULA and, and what it's like to work in a mission like this again? Yeah. Um, so I get to I get to work with the, the innards of the rocket, the electronics, the avionics boxes, ordnance, pyrotechnics, all that kind of stuff. So uh, working on a mission like this uh, is something really special um, to be able to get your hands on, on, on a vehicle like this and um, uh, do something that's going to affect the world. Um, is really really amazing well thank you very much again for being with us and I think we'll talk to you a little bit later in the broadcast mm -hmm. thank you Alyssa sounds good thanks And at 13 minutes into flight, uh, Delta IV upper stage is continuing the coast period prior to MES-2. Vehicle systems all performing nominally during this coast, seeing periodic thruster firings as expected. Uh, tank pressures and body rates remain stable.
and a uh, brief review of the uh, performance from the first burn, seeing a fairly close correlation on uh, major orbital elements. Performance appears to be pretty good. From the Mission Director Center, once again, we had an on-time liftoff of the Delta IV heavy rocket. On your screen, you were seeing a live telemetry view animation of the rocket on its flight path. Uh, so things are looking pretty good at this moment as we're in a, in a coast phase right now. And we'll go back to Marie Lewis for more on NASA's Parker Solar Probe. Marie. All right, thanks, Josh. And I don't know about you, but here in the studio, we could feel the rocket rumble. And I know for our, our folks here on the TV side, that never gets old. Uh, we have Tori standing by now with a very special guest. We've been talking about him the whole show. And Tori, we can't wait to meet him. Please introduce us. Thanks, Marie. I do certainly have a very special guest with me, Dr. Eugene Parker himself. Dr. Parker, you just watched the launch of the mission that bears your name. What was that like? Well, I really have to turn from biting my nails and getting it launched to thinking about all the interesting things which I don't know yet uh, and which will be made clear, I assume, over the next five or six or seven years. Uh, it's a whole new phase and it's going to be fascinating throughout. I'm anticipating that the results will turn up basic information on why the corona of the sun is at a million degrees. That accounts for the acceleration of, of the solar wind. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just waiting for the data now and uh, the experts can get busy and sort it out because there's an awful lot of data coming in or will be a lot of data coming in. Uh, all I can say is, wow, here we go. We're in for some learning over the next several years. That's right. So we'll definitely be anxiously awaiting that data and research. I also hear that this is the very first launch that you were able to witness with your own eyes. Is that right? That's right. So the video, of course, has supplied all of us with views of rocket launches. But somehow when you're looking at the real thing, uh, it's quite quite impressive. Nothing compares to the real thing, I would think. Yeah, it's a little like the Taj Mahal. Uh, we've all seen pictures of the building and what a graceful structure it is. But if you happen to be in India and stop by that way, there's the real thing and video and paintings and so forth. Just don't catch it somehow. Your mind is in a different state. <clears throat> when you're looking at the real thing. Well, we are certainly all honored to have you here with us this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Marie, we'll go back to you. All right, thanks, Tori. So great to have him here on the show. Understanding the sun will give us valuable information for future space missions. Mike Riskovich from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory is live on set now with NASA Edge's Blair Allen. Blair? Thanks so much, Marie. Listen, I got to tell you, I'm very excited, but I want to know, did you get out and see the launch, witness it firsthand? Oh, yeah, I'm really excited. I had to run outside, and it was an absolutely beautiful night. The, uh, the shock waves rolling over you, the uh, beautiful sight of those uh, three boosters rolling, and we could see it a long way. We could actually see the, uh, the burnout, which was at about uh, T plus four minutes, so really exciting night. Now, what you work with primarily at the Applied Physics Laboratory is uh, space ex exploration. How does a mission like this, we know the valuable science that it's going to get, but how does this help other missions in, in, with regard to space exploration? Well, this is going to be a really big deal, not just for space exploration, but people on Earth. Um, you're going to, we're going to get a lot of new knowledge, which is going to help uh, predictions and warnings of severe solar events that can take down the power grid or other pieces of our technological society. And then as we go uh, ever more uh, further into space, uh, robotically or human, uh, it's important to be able to get better forecasts and warnings for uh, the operators of the robotic spacecraft and the people that go there. It's today we're kind of like the mariners were in a few hundred years ago where you didn't get warnings of hurricanes and we want to be able to provide those warnings so we can keep people and uh, hardware safe. Yeah, exactly. Keeping our hardware safe and all those future missions we have and even some of our current missions will be able to help them as well. 
Yes. Um, no doubt. Um, you know, we try to design to, to withstand the harshest environment, but it's always uh, worthwhile to have a good warning and know when you got to hunker down and play things safe until the storm blows over, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming off console to be with us for a few minutes and answer some questions. We look forward to getting great things from Parker Solar Pro. Thanks. We look forward to it, too. You know, we got a starting line and a finish line. Finish line for the development team and the launch team and the starting line for the science team for seven years of discovery. So, awesome. thanks. Yep. Back to you, Marie. All right. Thanks, Blair. So how do we get close enough to the sun to actually sample its incredibly hot atmosphere? It's complicated, but NASA's Tori McClendon caught up with Dr. Nikki Fox, project scientist for this mission, to help illustrate Parker's path. Thanks, Marie. Nikki, thank you for being here. You're welcome. So there's so many fascinating things about this mission. One thing that I find particularly interesting is the unusual orbit that Parker's gonna take once it launches. Can you explain that? Yes, once we're in space, uh, it's a very busy first couple of weeks for us. Uh, we have to get it commissioned and all ready to go because just six weeks after launch, we encounter the planet Venus for the first time. We use Venus to give us a little gravity assist. Basically, it's like a little handbrake turn and it focuses our orbit in towards the sun because we don't want to be dragged around in any way or influenced by the Earth's orbit. And so during our 24 orbits of our seven year mission, we actually will do these flybys of Venus another six times. And each time, as you can see from this animation, our orbit is getting smaller and smaller until those final three orbits, we are at our final closest approach. Speaking of closest approach, can you describe exactly how close the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft is going to get to the sun? Yes, at our closest approach, we will be 3.83 million miles above mm. the sun's surface. And I realized that you just thought, million? That doesn't sound very close. Right. But you know, the Earth and the sun are 93 million miles apart. And so if I put the Earth and the sun in the end zones of a football field, Parker Solar Probe would tuck and run all the way to the sun's four yard line, well in the red zone, knocking on the door for a touchdown right by that goal line. Well, that sounds extremely close to me. So I'm sure that folks are now wondering, how is a spacecraft not going to burn up at the four yard line? We have a wonderful heat shield that uh, we keep oriented between uh, us mm -hmm. and the sun. And so it keeps everything in the main body of the spacecraft nice and cool. It kind of creates a shadow. And it has a white coating on it that was specially designed for Parker Solar Probe. Very much like you prefer to be in a white car on a hot day instead of a black car on a hot yes. day. The heat shield is glowing and it is reflecting a lot of the sun's energy. And so the front side of the heat shield gets to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but everything on the main body in that shadow is at about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So much like a pleasant Florida evening. That sounds so lovely. <laughs> well, Nikki, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're all extremely excited about this mission. Go Parker Solar Probe. And with that, Margie, we'll go back to you. We are coming up on another major milestone in Parker Solar Probe's flight. Let's, ho let's head over back over to Josh for the latest. Josh. Thank you, Marie. I'm here again with Alyssa McBeth, and we've been monitoring uh, the flight uh, as it's gone so far. And can you tell us a little about uh, where we are now and what's about to come up next? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, there was two, bur two burns of the second stage. So we're about to come up on that, that second burn. Um, after that, the engines will um, light and uh, will enter that that phase uh, and then they'll cut off and we'll enter into a coast phase right before a second stage separation. Um, then uh, the third stage will ignite um, at approximately um, 37 minutes into the flight um, and that will be our last and final burn before spacecraft separation. So we had a great launch on time this morning at 3.31 a.m., but, there, but there's still more work to do there is. Uh, before the spacecraft separates. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you tell me what's what's next for, for United Launch Alliance? Yeah, our team is still working. to They're monitoring data uh, in the launch control room and in Denver as well as here, um, just looking to make sure everything looks nominal, um, that the booster performed. They're probably looking at data from the booster and making sure everything looked, looked clear and good there. Um, and uh, as we continue through the flight, they'll continue to do that. Well, once again, you're looking at a uh, live telemetry feed here. That's It's an animated feed that you see of the second stage. Uh, when the very top of it, you see NASA's Parker Solar Probe there, uh, which is moving toward its separation time. And we just have confirmation of ignition of the RL-10 engine. 
And with that, Alyssa, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you for a great launch. Thanks for having me again. Yes. Thanks.